Hi, I'm Weston Labar with Cargomatic. Welcome to another episode of People on the Move, a Cargomatic podcast. I'm here today with Kevin Parkerson, former supply chain leader for companies like Walmart, Dollar General, and Hasbro. And now he's gone out on his own working with supply chain companies all over the U.S. to help them solve their various needs and issues. Kevin, thank you for joining us. And tell us a little bit about what you're doing these days. Hey, Weston. First of all, thank you very much for this opportunity. I'm really excited uh, to talk with you talk a little bit about what I'm doing, uh, what I'm hearing in the industry, and uh, kind of go from there. But yes, as you said, I've, I've been in the supply chain uh, space for over 30 years. Um, a good portion of that is in the international global logistics import maritime space. Um, you know, anything from freight forwarding, order management, ocean, port drayage, um, warehousing, all of that on the import side. Um, Due to some life events, uh, I've pivoted into the entrepreneurial uh, space um, for global logistics and have my business uh, from an advisory consulting standpoint that I'm really focusing on, on giving back uh, to these small and medium-sized importers or businesses, um, not limited to those, but really focusing on those type businesses that may not be resourced in a people or dollar standpoint um, that can take an adva advantage of someone with my background and experience and network to help uh, save a little money and improve service and um, you know even uh, uh, focusing on the people aspect of it uh, and helping them uh, develop uh, their internal talent and things of that nature. You know, I, I think that's a great way to frame it, too, is, is give back, because uh, as, as you and I have discussed, when you work for a top 100 importer, uh, you have a lot of levers that you can pull when things are not going right, which unfortunately happens far too often in our industry. A hiccup in one spot can create quite the bottleneck downstream or upstream, depending on what's going on. Uh, and when you're Walmart or Dollar General or Hasbro or any of the other top 100 importers, you, you have a, a few resources at your disposal that many small shippers either don't have or don't even realize they have. And so talk a little bit about what are some of the unique experiences that you've, you've seen um, going from working in-house at a very large importer to advising importers of all sizes um, and, and what are some of the real themes that you've seen based on uh, getting in and digging in? Is it, or is it around talent and not having teams? Is it around relationships and not understanding who's the right person to call? What are some of the things that that you've learned uh, working with the broader community? Because I, I love the way you phrase that. Now you're, you're giving back. You're taking that knowledge and, and helping bestow it upon a whole host of people that probably just don't even know where to start. Yeah, well, that that that's exactly what it is, Weston. Um, you know, not knowing where to start. And as I put together my business plan and my business model, um, as I set out on the entrepreneurial journey um, and creating this consulting advisory business, I knew that there would be, you know, an opportunity to, you know, to give back and educate. But I've been just thoroughly um, impressed with the openness that, you uh, uh, the small and medium size, you know, the vendor community. Um, I'm based in Northwest Arkansas, so there's a large um, vendor community um, that I've been able to plug into and uh, really um, start uh, uh, just sharing with them my history, my background, and from there, developing the relationships to allow them to open the door to their supply chain. And then that's when... Uh, that's when the, the magic starts to happen because you start then understanding that it, it, it's, it's really, you know, in many cases all over the place. Some supply chains are very, very um, mature um, and, and can be complex and others are in the infancy stage. Um, and that, that's where I've really been able to, to come in and help guide and advise on how to build that supply chain out um, from the ground up. In some cases, in other cases, it's more enhancing um, that network. But some of the themes really are, you know, it, it, it comes right down to the basics. Um, there were a lot of the things that were applicable in some of the larger companies that I've worked for, you know, having that, that flexibility, that nimble uh, network um, and adaptability of the network 
Um, and then also embracing technology. Um, you know, it's it's really uh, it's been really um, exciting for me to um, explore what is out there in the network, um, because, as you said, I've I've uh, had relationships and worked for large companies. I've had the visibility um, and the access to some pretty large companies and some pretty cool um, technology offerings. And now I'm able to um, I've been able to explore um, what's out there, what's new and upcoming. And a lot of that is really, really exciting, but a lot of it has application, not just to the large guys, but to the small and medium sized importers as well. And then, you know, really the foundation of a lot of what um, I work with uh, our clients on are really fostering strong partnerships in that relationship piece um, of this industry, um, which I know um, you and I, um, have talked a little bit about how important that is in this uh, in this time and in, in this industry. Um, that's really been the foundation of of, of my career um, from the very beginning. A lot of great mentors and leaders um, set that foundation for me, and that's a big uh, foundation of of my my business as well. So that's you know really a lot of what um, I work with clients on is developing those strong partnerships. Um, to help them navigate through the complexities of, of the industry and the thing, the challenges. Um, because of uh, my background and experience and the companies I've been blessed to work with, um, you know, I've got a very vast, wide and deep network that I can tap into um, that I've developed these partnerships and relationships with um, that have some application for some of these small and medium sized uh, importers. So um, it, it's really, uh, you know, the basics um, that a lot of these clients are really looking and businesses are looking for um, to help establish um, a, a, a adaptable, flexible um, supply chain network. Um, and I'm really excited about uh, um, that aspect of the business. Yeah. And I, I can imagine each individual uh, customer of yours, client of yours is dealing with their own unique set of circumstances, right? They're going into different ports, they have different vendors, uh, different potentially product lines and customers, et cetera. What are some of the big topics of discussion that are are eating away at your current clients? Yeah, yeah. Well, what's what's top of mind right now for a lot of them are, you know, the current the current uh, uh, timeline of the industry, which is, ocean contract uh, renewal process. Um, thankfully, I've been able to get in on, on the beginning stages many, many months ago. Um, months ago, um, it is a process. You know, it's not, you don't start this in uh, March and finalize it in April. Um, but uh, the contract renewal process and getting on the beginning stages of assessing um, the network, um, defining what those objectives are, uh, really looking in the mirror um, at yourself as a, as a company and what you have to offer and being that that customer of choice um, and really understanding what it is that you need and what you bring to the table. Um, but contract renewal, it really is, uh, you know, a hot topic. Um, also, the geopolitical um, situation and, you know, the Red Sea, the Panama Canal, uh, potential labor disruptions, ILA, um, on the East Coast, those are things that um, some of the uh, more mature supply chains um, and maybe a little bit more advanced in their annual renewal contracting process. Um, if I'm not advising on the renewal process, um, I definitely am um, guiding them and helping uh, contingency planning um, and incorporating that into the contract renewal process as well um, for what's going on in the world, uh, whether it be the Red Sea, or Panama Canal, or ILA. Yeah, and before we get into contingencies, because as we all know, um, I used to joke uh, every year, you know, oh, this is a once in a lifetime event. Well, I, I've had at least one once in a lifetime event every year I've been in this industry. So at a certain point in time, you, you just know that things are gonna go awry. There will be disruptions. You don't know when they'll pop up and what they'll look like, but you need to have backup plans because I believe gone are the days of set it and forget it. You're, you know, you you put all your orders in with your vendors and it just works. You, you need to have the right partners, the right vendors, the, the type of folks that can actually service you, where you need to be serviced, how you need to be serviced. 
Um, and, and, you know, whether that's on the land side, transportation side with a company like Cargomatic, um, or whether, it, as you talk about in your ocean contract negotiation, are you seeing shippers uh, going through this year's negotiation? I'm hearing that prices, you know, may, may have moderate, uh, or I should say very modest increases, not very high. Most shippers think they're going to be able to get somewhere in the ballpark of what they've been paying. But one of the bigger things, and, and I can, you know, you can, it seems like the pricing market's going to remain pretty stable uh, going through the next 12 months. But some of the other discussions are around, do I put all my eggs in one basket with ocean carriers? And do I want to be um, diversified amongst a lot of ocean carriers? Or in this market where where the, the steamship lines are very hungry for business, do I consolidate into one or maybe a small number of carriers and have more influence in how my cargo is treated? I'm sure you're having conversations on the pros and cons of both of those. What has the feedback been? Right, right. Now, this is a great topic. I'm glad, you know, we're talking about this because this is this is really, a, you know, it's a foundation of what I, um, as a company, and what I've learned, um, you know, through... Uh, 30 years um, in the industry is contingency planning and having a diversified network. Um, and one of the first things that I really address um, and try to get, uh, you know, a real good assessment with clients on is their willingness um, to take that approach and have a diversified uh, strategy and incorporating your contingency planning into your relationship development and building and your strategy and ultimately your contract renewal uh, process. So that's why it's, again, as I mentioned before, it's a multi-month process um, to be able to go through and do that. Now, there are some, you know, um, it's really been um, uh, really all, all, over the, all over the board in a way um, in regards to willingness and acceptance of that. Um, you know, there's still... Uh, um, you know, the last couple of years have been tough um, for a lot of uh, a lot of businesses, and there's there's still a few in under the mindset of I've got to get recover and get back uh, what was owed to me. Um, but uh, the majority are really uh, taking the you know what I like to see is that strategic um, approach versus the transactional tactical approach, um, and that's really where. Um, if I can get in on the, the beginning stages um, with uh, an importer and a business um, to really um, understand what the key drivers are and the objectives um, within the company, like I said, really looking in the mirror um, on what you have to offer, that's when um, I really get excited about uh, uh, really putting a, a strategic approach um, and a strategy to the contract renewal process, but it really is uh, pretty wide ranging on, you know, what everyone, uh, what the approach is going to, um, has been uh, thus far, at least in, you know, the, the, the businesses that I'm working with and I've talked to, um, that's been my experience thus far. So as you've talked about uh, different, different strategies for different shippers, obviously one of the things that we're looking at is is volume and forecast. And as as we thought last at the end of last year, it's been a very strong first quarter um, really throughout the US, but we've saw it specifically on the West Coast having some, again, almost record months. Uh, and and a lot there's a lot of reasons you've already touched on, which we'll get into on the contingency side. Um, geopolitical, potential labor disruptions, et cetera. But um, we plan on having John Gold on in a, in a month or so, and he always goes over the NRF forecasts. And I think for the last year, the NRF has been very bullish on forecasts for things like back to school, holiday shopping, and they've been su successful in those forecasts where obviously we've seen um, better than expected in many cases. Uh, and, and these were highly touted numbers um, uh, performance by retailers in, in the market. What are you hearing right now as, as it relates to, uh, what your clients are thinking from volume projection? Yeah, that's a great, great question. Again, a key topic, you know, as I talk to clients, um, uh, in general, um, that's typically one of the top questions I'm asking is, you know, first of all, what's your forecasting look like? Um, and how has it been and what's the current, uh, Current, what's your current inventory situation? Um, uh, what does that look like? And I can tell you, Weston, you know, probably in the last, uh, you know, since the new year, 
the vibe is a lot more optimistic um, and the vibe is a lot more, um, you know, uh, uh, a little bit more clarity on what the year obviously um, is going to look like as we get closer and closer to the summer months and uh, the fall, a lot more clarity on exactly what that's going to look like. But the vibe um, from the clients that I'm talking to, um, it, it's very, very optimistic and very positive versus, you know, last fall, um, a lot of uncertainty, um, a lot of ambiguity, um, a, a lot of negativity in regards to what 2024 um, would look like from a, a forecasting volume standpoint. I will say most everybody at this point feels really good about where their inventory levels are at which tells you, you know, um, um, again, uh, the last couple of years, uh, that's been a, a big challenge, but I believe most everybody feels that they've come out of that um, with a really good, uh, um, a good positioning um, from an inventory level standpoint. I still don't think that a lot uh, really have their arms around, um, you know, in the event something like that would happen again, um, that they would have their, um, a good process um, in place from a demand planning standpoint and forecast. Um, and that's where I'm working with a couple of clients um, in, in enhancing that and leveraging some technology that could ha actually help in that area as well. Yeah, and that's that's a great segue into the contingency planning because you, you brought up some interesting things that any one of them by themselves create uh, issues for shippers, whether it's geopolitical issues in the Red Sea, creating longer lead times to be able to get your product that was already in transit uh, to U.S. ports, uh, whether it's the Panama Canal and you know shifting trade lanes, then trying to leverage the Panama Canal for access points to Gulf and East Coast ports from from Asia, or, or whether it is the looming uh, you know labor negotiations uh, that haven't been finalized and, and ratified with the ILA on the East and Gulf Coast. Uh, where, where are you seeing the majority of the concern? Because everybody, again, has a little bit of a different uh, outlook as to what impacts them. But then also a, a secondary question is, we saw a lot of freight move from the West Coast to the East and Gulf Coast when there was uh, the threat of any sort of labor disruption on the West Coast. And uh, are you seeing uh, the migration back? Obviously, there's a lot more hair on the situation when you look at the two canals, but are you seeing that movement back where shippers trying to do what they can to stand pat because of investments they've made in, in new regions? Uh, because obviously, if something does happen, they need that contingency plan. And who better to talk to about that than somebody who's had to deal with it in the past? Yeah. Wow, you know, we could we could probably do an hour on, on, on this topic, right? Uh, this one's a really, really good one as well, um, that if I can get uh, clients to think beyond a little bit of you know, the contract renewal process and what's in the windshield right now, which is really, you know, the Red Sea and the Suez Canal and that situation. What, you know, what I always tell everybody and you hear everyone say, and, you know, we heard it at TPM as well, there is not a crystal ball that tells you um, how these are going to pan out and what the next one is really going to be. Um, but from a contingency standpoint, and this is where, um, you know, I, I really, really focus on um, developing a network and working with partners so that when the next event, whatever that may be, and if it's an ILA um, labor, you know, situation disruption or some other geopolitical beyond the Red Sea or the Panama Canal, um, that the network is ready uh, and nimble enough and flexible enough and diversified enough to be able to handle and manage that um, and quickly. Um, I'm not hearing and seeing a lot of, um, at this point, uh, um, you know, shifting of cargo um, from one, one area to the other. Um, I'm not a real big proponent of the, the major shifts. I am, you know, a real big proponent of identifying, you know, critical cargo and having plans for that and understanding and knowing from a timing standpoint um, how to plan for that type cargo um, versus um, a major shift. Um, a major shift in any network is extremely difficult and costly um, and maybe can and should be done in certain situations. Um, but I'm not hearing, you know, anyone 
um, really uh, talking about uh, doing anything major at this point. It's really uh, um, uh, developing, you know, contingencies um, in your current network. And that is a big part of that is working with your partners um, and, and having a plan um, to expedite cargo um, through your current gateway um, versus shifting it to uh, somewhere else. And um, through my 30 years, I've probably been more successful in doing that than, you know, shifting cargo to a, a different gateway um, that maybe I don't have a relationship at and not familiar with um, and then adds cost. But there are certain situations where it may make sense to do that, but um, there, um, I'm not uh, um, uh, participating in any big shift plans um, uh, at, at this point in time, but there's a lot of time. Uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, key milestones um, in uh, in the ILA uh, labor disruptions that I think everyone needs to stay really, really close to. And again, be prepared for and have a network and incorporate it into your contract renewal process today. Um, and then as soon as you get done with that, be prepared to uh, to visit with your uh, service providers to to make sure that the plan is ready to execute. Yeah, around here we like to say Plan A is cargomatic, and then with our thirty-five thousand trucks uh, in every seaport and rail ramp across the country, Plan B is cargomatic, and Plan C is cargomatic. So, like you know, having built-in contingency planning with your vendor is super important when you need to sh when you do need to shift when those milestones do impact uh, your your supply chain or when you need to uh, have more fortified relationships from a tactical perspective on the ground. Having a good transportation partner, having good landside partners is equally as important, as you know, Kevin, as having a good ocean partner and uh, a good rail partner. And so uh, I, I think that uh, as a company, you know, we try to position ourselves in that same vein as being the agile, right? And uh, the two big the two big words that we've heard over and over during COVID were uh, agility and uh, the ability to change quickly, obviously, from pivot from one to the next. And, and the other was uh, the ability to have contingency plans, right? And having flexibility built into your supply chain. And so you're advising them. We're trying to do it as well every single day. And uh, for the customers that have embraced the ability to move quickly, uh, I, I think they've seen less impacts to their supply chains. Um, that that leads me into a next question, though, because one of the contingency plans some folks have in these situations is front loading. And obviously, with a lot of the uh, cargo upticks we've seen here in Q1 of 2024, uh, there's some feeling, is, is this because of inventory replenishment, because people are comfortable with where their inventory index is? Or is that uh, front? Is it front loading because they do know there are potential challenges down the road, and they're saying, you know what, we have some key milestones throughout the year. Let's try to get our freight in maybe a little bit early and and try to reduce any risk of bottlenecks down the road. Uh, are you seeing front loading yet, or or is that something we still may see? Is this just normalized increased volume? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a mix of all of that, Weston. You know, there is a little bit of front loading for very commodity driven, very specific to certain industries. Um, but uh, um, right now and probably in the next 30, 60, 90 days, um, we'll get a lot more visibility and clarity to, to if that front loading will continue to ramp up a, a little bit more. Um, you know, that, that definitely is a, a lever to pull and needs to be a part of your contingency. But you really have to have uh, a really good uh, demand planning um, an internal visibility to exactly what those items um, are and working with your manufacturer vendors to be able to um, produce and to be able to do that. And then, you know, obviously you got to have uh, um, some really good warehousing distribution partners um, that can help you in those areas as well. Um, it's not a knee jerk type uh, or if it is a knee jerk for you, it's probably not going to end very well. Um, it shouldn't be a knee jerk. You need to be preparing uh, for that. But I'm I'm not I'm not aware of anything um, significant. I think, like I said, it really is a mix. Um, a good portion of it is right sizing a little bit of the inventory levels that we were talking about before, uh, because I think that has been depleted um, quite a bit uh, in certain areas uh, for certain commodities. 
for certain retailers. Yeah, I I agree. Everybody uh, has their own unique needs, as we've as we've said. Yeah. Uh, so last question, um, and I think this this one may be the most important. Uh, what would you say, at very high level, the top three just pieces of of uh, advice that broadly apply for shippers? Uh, what are the top three things that you think that shippers should be looking at as they're going into 2024? Um, just as a, as like I said, high level, 30,000 foot. If you're not doing this, you're doing something wrong and probably need somebody like you uh, to come in and help uh, advise them on, on how really to address these types of, of concerns. Yeah. The number one is really your service providers, you know, um, and those relationships if they are needing to be mended or if they're needing to be developed, enhanced, um, it's ultra critical. There are some phenomenal service providers out there with um, great partners, very collaborative. You need and want those on your side to be prepared for the, the geopolitical, the next event, whatever it may be. Um, so really focusing in on if you haven't, uh, if you've been a little bit more transactional, um, uh, I, you know, developing a strategic partner, identifying who that is, um, and being that customer of choice as well. Um, that's ultra important. The other one really is, is leveraging technology. You know, um, there are some phenomenal things. Um, I'm not going to talk about, uh, you know, AI, but, uh, there are a lot of things being done in the technology space, um, in, you know, procurement, visibility, forecasting, demand planning, that if you're not incorporating into your overall strategy, you're going to be left behind and um, the competitive advantage will, will wilt away. Um, and then the third one really is a little bit, you know, kind of rolled up into the other two is your people. You know, you need to be taking care of your people. Um, and I love talking about supply chain and contingency planning and relationships and procurement. Um, but I always, you know, I, I lead in with the, with the client, you know, on are you eating? Are you drinking uh, well? Are you hydrated? Are you getting exercise? Are you seeing your friends and family? Um, and if the answers are not good in that area, then, you know, I, I, I want to be able to help address that. Um, and I've got some resources. I'm not maybe the subject matter expert, but I've got resources um, that I can tap into that can help um, businesses and companies do that. You've got to take care of your people. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to develop your strategy. You're not going to be able to take advantage of your technology. Um, so really taking care of your people um, so that they can uh, uh, do well for you, but also do well for themselves in their career. Yeah, culture and people, they're the foundation of every great organization and couldn't agree more. You got the right people in place. They can develop and execute on the right strategies and technology really is what's driving the future of our industry. Um, so whether it is uh, very simple things like management system, CRMs, uh, track and trace, GPS type solutions, or whether it's the more enhanced things like computer vision and AI and, and big data modules, uh, you're right, there, there's a, a need for not just understanding how technology plays a role, but having the right people that understand how to implement them uh, for, for successful outcomes is, is crucial. And people are still at the heart of everything we do in the supply chain, relationships and people. So uh, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, Kevin, any final thoughts you want to leave for the listeners and viewers? You know, it, it, it's a little bit related to to what you were just mentioning. You know, a lot of my clients uh, uh, are, are are happy with their current service provider or their current technology offering, um, and that's great and wonderful. Um, but I always challenge them to stay attuned to the industry and the network, and you know, continue. Um, educating yourself and being made aware of what's in the industry. Um, that's probably, you know, one thing, if I look back at my career, I wish I'd done a little bit, um, a, a better job of doing, of staying um, uh, attuned to the network, uh, the industry. So if you're happy with your service providers and technology offerings, that's great and wonderful, but I would stay connected with what's going on in the market and industry so that you're not left behind. Um, so stay engaged. I can help in those areas. 
Uh, like I said, I have a, a you know a very wide and deep network that um, can make some connections for you to um, just be aware of what your competition uh, might be doing, uh, what offerings they might be exploring, what's being developed in the industry. Um, the industry changes pretty quickly um, uh, in, in that regard, and it is right now. So I would just challenge everyone to kind of stay stay close to that. Um, and if I can help in those areas, I'd love to be able to do that. No, I, I hear you loud and clear. What I'm hearing loud and clear is if you don't have somebody like Kevin advising you, telling you where the different potential pitfalls are in your supply chain, you need to get an outside set of eyes on it and understand where, where maybe there's some blind spots. And again, everything that you've talked about points to one thing, which is you need to have a vendor like Cargomatic that can partner with you everywhere, has has next level technology, and has the relationships to really get things done. So, Kevin, I appreciate it on behalf of all of Cargomatic. We appreciate you joining us for this episode of People on the Move. Uh, keep us in mind as as you continue to advise where there's good fits, obviously, and we'd love to have you on down the road again to hear what you're hearing from your customer base, your clients, and just what you're seeing uh, as a as a veteran of the industry. So for uh, for this episode of People on the Move, I'm Weston Labar with Cargomatic. Until next time. Music.